Hi everyone. I'm excited for this webinar on using bungee cords. I know there were some questions about what, what do we do with those? And kind of a little play, getting a pull out of a bungee cord, um, doing some resistance training and that sort of stuff. So this is an activity that I use quite a bit, not only for uh, rehabbing dogs, but also a lot with cross training and conditioning. So it's something very fun to work with. So um, I'm excited to present this to you today. And when we look like, so there's so many things and so many ways a dog needs power, energy, and strength. This is just, um, I work a lot with the police dogs in our state and some of their, their bite work and that sort of stuff that they do. Um, but certainly if you go hiking with your dog, they do a lot of running, agility, fly ball, anything like that. This is great to start to add a little bit more resistance as well as endurance to challenge their workout program. I also on low levels use this with dogs that have recuperated from either cruciate surgery or <laughs> my dog doesn't agree with that cruciate surgery or um, we're trying to do conservative or also is a, if there's a soft tissue injury and you know we're always looking for different ways to challenge our dogs and kind of take up the edge you know certainly especially during these crazy times you know looking for other ways to help you know, just keep us excited, keep um, the dogs excited, and do a little bit of cross training. So something fun for you to do during many of us are in COVID restrictions. So with resistance training, we are going to see a lot of benefits from resistive, resistance training, certainly building up muscle. And the more muscle there is, the safer the joints are, the more calories the dog is going to burn. Same works for us. Um, so the you know, building up muscle is going to support the body and support the tissues. We also know resistance training is going to help protect against injury. Cruciate tears, as I mentioned, is a, a common injury we see in many dogs. Can we always prevent them? No but can we stack the cards in their favor so we can reduce the chance? And that we can do. So we want to help protect against an injury. Um, as I mentioned, it's also going to help burn calories better. And that's always an important thing. You know, again, looking at just maybe many of us are spending more time at home. I've been noticing in my clinic a lot more dogs are coming in a little bit heavier than they were at the beginning of the year. Um, also increasing bone density. For the women that are listening to this over the age of 45, you know that we have to pay attention to our bone density. So bones going to form according to the stresses placed on it. So certainly if we can put, you know, safe amount of pressure, that is going to help significantly. Resistance training is also going to improve stamina. When I often hear that a dog may be petering out with um, any sort of activity, whether it's agility, whether it's hiking, I always look to add some resistance and core training. Exercise also reduces insomnia. Some of our dogs don't have that problem. I have two clumber spaniels and they are um, definitely uh, like to sleep a lot. And then definitely improve conditions such as diabetes, depression, arthritis, and obesity. And as I had mentioned, just looking at obesity, you know, definitely adding just a little bit of strength training can make a big difference in helping to, again, build up some muscle and burn some of those calories. Some other things that we'll look at with resistance training, we know there's going to be increased blood flow to the muscle fibers increased availability of fuel to the muscles. So I had back maybe six months ago now had a total knee replacement. Probably one of the worst decisions I've made, but um, definitely coming back and as I'm starting to walk and starting to push 
my distance, also build up some of my quad muscles and hamstrings and that sort of stuff. But the more um, resistance training I'm doing, I know I could feel my strength. I'm not even thinking about running up a flight of stairs right now, which is fantastic. Their resistance training is also going to increase the cell mitochondria. And these are like the, the, the brains of the cells. And that's going to in turn create energy for the cells, which is fantastic. So again, just getting that blood flow, the energy, all of that. Stronger bones, as I indicated. So definitely we want to always respect this, especially with puppies and our senior dogs. And if there's any sort of uh, injury going on there. But regular activity and proper resistance training is going to improve the strength of the bones. Stronger connective tissue. And the connective tissue is everything else that kind of hangs out there that, that helps. We hear so much about um, medial shoulder injuries or just soft tissue in injuries to the shoulder. And working on improving the connective tissue strength will help. And then also resistance training is going to increase flexibility. So another very, very important key component. So, and when we do resistance training, we can really um, tailor it to the dog's needs. So we can work on the various body parts. Um, when we're working on the bungee activity, we are working a little bit more on the flexors. So the abdominals, the hip flexors, the shoulder flexors, everything that kind of bends the dog in. I also love it because it works on the toe flexors. And for those of you that run your dogs in dirt or sand, do herding or practice and compete in agility on soft surfaces, this is wonderful. Toe injuries can be fairly significant and we kind of, you know, sometimes we'll forget about those toes and how important they are with everything else. Um, so very important to, to work on that area. And as I mentioned, so these toe flexors, as we're utilizing the bungee and we're pulling forward, you can see the dogs really start to dig in with their toes um, and their lower legs. And we're, we're gaining a lot of activity there. So this is something that I love to, to do um, with the dogs. I'm working remotely with a, uh, a Siberian Husky that had an amputation, a hind limb amputation from a, a growth deformity. And she is fortunate, she has snow, and we're working on already set her up in harness and she's doing a little bungee cord activity, activating those toe flexors and getting them going. So pretty exciting. So safety with the bungee cord. So there are a lot of different things that we have to factor in. And you know, first is making sure no one's going to poke an eye out. Um, because bungee cords are pretty readily available. I'll show you some options of some of them. Um, but we want to make sure we have a safe area to secure the bungee onto. So we don't want it on something that can snap back and take out our eye, the dog's eye, snap at us, any sort of thing like that. Um, so we want to be careful with that. Is it strong enough? And some of these dogs can definitely pull. We want a good surface to pull on. And I'll go over that further. A proper fitting harness. And I'll review that. And then a safe area as well. So we'll talk about some flooring as well. So with the harnesses, you want a harness a dog can pull in. So most of um, the harnesses that I like, and these will have to be tailored for your dog, um, sled dog harnesses or weight pulling harnesses, and they could run anywhere from $20 to $40 in the US. Um, and they're fit pretty nicely and they evenly distribute the pull. So obviously we do not want to use a no pull harness. That is not going to work. I had a client question why this wasn't working and we figured it out because she had a no pull harness on her dog. Um, also no head halters or martingales or obviously no choke collars. So it has to be a harness. 
Typically, we'll start in the clinic with just a simple harness until they get used to it and then move into something a little bit more serious. And as I mentioned, sled dark harnesses are the, the most optimal as well as the, the weight pulling. And there are a variety of websites out there that have, have great ones. And this will evenly distribute the pull across the dog's body. So we wanna secure the bungee, I put that, this jumping. I am deathly afraid of heights and I saw this, I thought, oh my God. So, but some of the bungees have um, eye hooks, others have clips. So my experience with the clips is they may not always hold on and you have to be careful. Um, but again, just making sure that these are clipped on, that they're safe. So they're a variety of um, different types of, of bungees you could look at. Um, here is just a little close up of what the hooks look like. And typically once I know that I'm gonna use a bungee, I'll take some tape and wrap up the, the end of the bungee just to you know soften it in case it does release. And there are many sources, many sizes of, of bungees and all of that. Um, you could definitely get them at hardware stores or Amazon, um, Target, that sort of stuff. I mean, if you have an RV, I'm sure you have a lot of <laughs> bungee cords. Ideally, you want them four to six feet in length and um, longer for larger dogs. I don't like to go over six feet because we're starting to lose some control there. But, you know, take a look around. You also want um, the right uh, texture. So obviously a Great Dane is going to use a much thicker bungee cord than, say, a Chihuahua. So we want to, as you see what we're starting to do, we want the dog to move with the bungee. We don't want them to, um, you know, not be able to move at all. So some of the Police shepherds that I work with have a pretty thick bungee cord because that's what that's what works for them. Um, much different than the smaller dogs. We want to secure flooring. So as we look at the flooring, we don't want to do this on something slippery, anything icy, that sort of stuff. Either a textured floor. Um, we have a textured floor and then I'll put phthalate free yoga mats over it so the dog's able to grab some grip. Um, good matting, you know, so many of you have great surfaces to work on with your training facilities, and that's fantastic. Uh, you want to avoid tile, wood floor, anything else slippery. So if the dog's trying to grasp at things, you know, at the floor and they're slipping, we are going to do more harm than good. So, you know, pick something that will have good texture. And then when we look at the pull of the bungee cord, so I'll show you a, a bad pull uh, later on, but we want the pull to be parallel to the dog's back. And certainly this can be difficult if you have multi-sized dogs, um, you're going to have to adjust or find something. You know, one of the common mistakes is setting up the bungee too high so the dog is pulling down and away. And this can put added stress onto the elbows, onto the shoulders, also the neck area. So we want it to be parallel to the dog's back and parallel to the dog's floor. And I'll show you another image of this shortly. And we look at the movement. So this is a friend's dog in a golf cart and I just happened to catch her. Thought this was a great form of eccentric activity. So she's sort of just holding on there and uh, before she drops down. When we look at the movement, we're looking at the movement forward and backward. So the dog is going to step forward. And unlike the bungee cord where you jump off a cliff, you go flying back, we want the dog to slowly move back. And the progression is usually, and we'll see some starting videos of a dog that I'm working with, that the forward takes some time, and then the backward is going to demand a lot of control as well as eccentric activity. And it's then definitely trying to figure out if the dog can back up slowly. They can understand what is being asked of them. So we'll take that very, very slowly and we'll concentrate more and forward and then get them to move back. 
but really with this movement, so we're working every different type of muscle contraction, what's called concentric, isometric as they hold, and then eccentric that's slowing down. And certainly all three of these are so important, not, in, um, not only in sporting activities, but everyday movements. If you are, you know, buddy buddies with your dog and you love to go hiking and do stuff like that, this is, they are going to engage in every one of those activities. And then certainly we will look at preemptive core strength. So um, before the dog jumps into doing any bungee work, we want them to have good core strength. So whatever you're doing with your program is going to be important. So um, utilizing the bungee cord is going to be a component of, the, um, of your workout program, not the only part. So whatever you do, you know, whatever any type of core work, will be crucial to start to set that up. Certainly endurance activities, walking, hiking. Walking up a steep hill is wonderful to start to engage the lower legs. So the hind limb will get some good activity there so they can start putting some strength on to um, you know, begin with a bungee cord. I usually like to see a dog be able to walk up a steep hill without bunny hopping um, also be able to use their legs independently. The underwater treadmill, if they have, you know, you have access to it, perfect. If not, just regular endurance activities is fine. Here's me with one of my clumbers out for a walk um, last year. And the, I, the bungee activity is a strenuous activity. And a lot of people are surprised at how quickly the dog will fatigue. And you may do two or three pulls and then they're, they're done. And that's okay. So we're always going to respect what the dog is telling us. So we wanna take it slow. And my rule of thumb is they're allowed to be tired four to six hours after the activity. It shouldn't go more than that. So if they're fatigued, the next day or really later on that night, we've overdone it. And, you know, just rest. Certainly if there's any pain or reluctance to do this activity, then discontinue it. So, you know, don't be afraid to just um, stop the activity. And this may not work for everybody and we'll see some, some reasons why too. Certainly when we look at contraindications or things or reasons why this may not work. A dog that will not pull. Many of us have trained our dogs so, um, so diligently not to pull on the leash. So in here we're asking the dog to pull towards something which, you know, may not, may not want to do. So if your dog just refuses to pull, it's probably not the exercise for you. Um, a lot of times with dogs that are so trained, we're able to um, give them a command. We use a very high value, high reward treat to have them step forward. And they know that this is an exercise. So it'll depend upon what you wanna do with that. If there's any stress on any injured area. So if the dog is favoring something, or again, they, they want, to pull, normally they're pullers and they just don't want to. This could be putting stress somewhere. So again, like don't, we don't wanna force this. If I'll ask the dog to usually try to do something three times, if on the third time they don't wanna do it, then we're going to move on to something else. The same thing if pulling, you notice any lameness or stress, then we're going to discontinue. Nothing that we do with any sort of activity should cause any pain or lameness. The other thing is hind end weakness. This pug is demonstrating a significant amount of hind end weakness stemming from his lower back. So he would not be a candidate. This is actually um, a fairly strenuous exercise for him. And I wanted to show his, his owner how much atrophy he has in his hind end. So any hind end weakness, we're gonna take a step back, we're gonna work more on that core. So at any time, you know, if the, the dog 
doesn't have the, the ability to walk up that hill, utilize their hind limb, there, um, we're not going to do this. For those of you that don't have a hill anywhere, um, a land treadmill on an incline is another way that we can work those that area.